I'm Hunsley from Livewire Markets and welcome to the Signal All Noise Commodities Show. Our last commodity centric program was done just over 12 months ago, but even in that time the world has changed dramatically. Last year investors were still coming to grips with the war in Ukraine, now they must add on the war in the Middle East as well. The geopolitical risk, coupled with the solid economic data, offsetting some but not all concerns around higher for longer interest rates, and it's leading investors to pile into oil and gold linked products perhaps at the expense of former market darlings lithium and uranium. So how do investors navigate this environment? Joining me and our resident panelist, of course, Deanna Messina, Deputy Chief Economist at AMP, are two men who know a thing or two about commodities. They are Ben Goodwin of Merlin Capital Partners and Daniel Sullivan of Janice Henderson Investors. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with a discussion about two of our most important exports, and that's iron ore and copper. Iron ore prices are down in excess of 13% over the last year, while copper prices have completed a round trip back to that crucial 9,000 US dollar level, which had last topped one year ago. And you can see those charts on the screen now. Of course, both of these commodities are important to Australia, but they are also very exposed to the Chinese economy. And of course, that means any fluctuations in demand play a big role in our fortunes. This chart, which we're going to show you now, comes from the US Conference Board, and it shows China's leading economic indicators. What does it prove? It still signals that the world's second largest economy, hurtling towards a recession, driven primarily by that sluggish consumer, deflation worries, and the ramifications of its ongoing real estate crisis. So, first question of the day, panel. Is the Australian economy, and come to think of it, are Australian investors, too prone or vulnerable to these prices? And Deanna, I'll toss that to you first. Is that a signal or noise? Signal. I mean, obviously, what happens in China and the impact of commodity prices is extremely important to Australia through the trade channel. But at the same time, I, I want to qualify that with saying in the last few years since we had some trade disputes with China and we had to find new export markets, Australia did that extremely well. Now, it wasn't related to iron ore, coal or LNG. It was more around the agriculture space. So it wasn't as important to Australia but at the same time, I think Australia can diversify away from China, although I guess we haven't seen a huge amount of uh, challenges to our major exports, especially in volume terms. I think prices can come down, but as long as volumes don't drastically drop, that's kind of the crux for the Australian economy. Yeah, well, that is the key. Let's talk trade and uh, bring up this chart you've brought along. We've got iron ore here versus our terms of trade. It's been the subject of this one. Why did you bring this along? Well, you can obviously see the very close correlation between the two, but uh, what's important is what does the terms of trade mean for Australia? I mean, this is a concept that economists always talk about. The terms of trade is ultimately uh, one of the guides to national income. So as the terms of trade increases, our national income increases. Now, that doesn't necessarily go directly into consumer hip pockets, but it is better for the Australian economy. It goes to businesses and then the money flows through to the government and the government can then do what it likes with that money. We've seen the past few years that extra iron ore uh, revenue and commodities revenue has driven our budget surplus higher. That's allowed the government to put through some cost of living relief. So the terms of trade is really important to uh, look at for Australia. But as well as that, if you look at the chart, you can see that really in the past five, six years, there has been a bit of a breakdown between that direct relationship with iron ore and the terms of trade. Uh, before 2015, we saw quite a strong relationship be between the two, but I think it looks a little bit softer now. So there are obviously other commodities that are also important to our terms of trade story. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that along. Daniel, where are you going to fall on this one? Signal or noise? Uh, signal as well. I think China is absolutely critical for commodities and iron ore has been a, a dream run for Australia at enormous volume growth over many decades and much higher prices for a lot longer than most people expected. So I think it will fade. China definitely wants to diversify down and away from us. They didn't have many choices uh, in the past, but they're, they're you know, working their way to having other suppliers over time and um, that will fade down for us, I think, as time goes on. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Ben, what do you think on this signal or noise? Yeah, definite signal. Yep. Um, iron ore, 25% of um, Australia's exports, if you include Met Coal, which I think, you know, they go hand in hand. You need both of them to, um, to operate a blast furnace. So uh, for me, that's a massive, uh, a massive number in terms of an export-led economy like Australia, so 25%. Um, so any sort of mix shift in terms of the Chinese economy, um, you know, for me is a real risk for that. Okay. Um, as you may have noticed, we have two commodities focused portfolio managers on the panel today. So I thought we could harness both of your expertise there, Daniel and Ben. Within that China facing commodity space, 
Are there any particular stocks that you're, you're bullish on? And maybe Daniel, I'll turn to you first on this one. Yeah, I mean, because of iron ore's long run, we've actually weighted that down. And the other major oh. segment that's doing very well is copper. Are there any companies then that you... Uh, yes, so in the Australian one? context, Sandfire, and uh, we like it. I mean, there's not many copper companies left here. Um, but what they have done in the last five years is really transform themselves and extend their life and um, it's a totally different company now so if you, if you haven't followed what they've done it's worth reading up on and um, they're in a great position for a, a big copper rally. Okay sand fire for you Daniel. Ben what about you when you look at that China facing commodity space how do you think about it? Yeah look not so much iron ore um, or copper but again the Met coal piece. Yep. Um, what we're seeing is you know as China sort of tries to um, restructure its economy away from being you know heavy industry led and more towards you know technology and renewables manufacturing and the like um, so that sort of, you know, potentially is, a, uh, is an overhang in terms of demand for iron ore. But then if you look at the uh, Indian economy, which is now very large and growing, in, uh, you know, very rapidly, um, it's kind of a flip in terms of, you know, what they have supply of, which is iron ore themselves, um, but not so much met coal. So we're now looking at the met coal spaces, you know, a potential area of interest and, uh, and, and Whitehaven coal following their acquisition of um, a couple of BHP's met coal assets look pretty well positioned for that. Okay, thank you for that. Let's move on to our second topic. And in this case, all that glitters is gold. A record price for gold specifically. Gold's Australian dollar price hit all-time highs recently, topping $3,300 per troy ounce. But as you'll soon see in this chart, ASX gold miners, and come to think of it, the gold miners ETF, has not tracked this same ride. So that's led Russell Chesler of Vanek to make this bold prediction. Quote, this current disparity creates an opportunity and we think the anomaly is more extreme compared to 2011, given that over the past decade, miners have strengthened balance sheets and improved cash flow generation. So panel and Daniel, we're gonna start with you for this round. Do you agree with Russell? Is this the once in a decade opportunity for gold? Signal or noise? Uh, yeah, definitely signal and very strong. So this breakout in gold's probably more than just a decade. This is probably generational. So 30-year um, wow, okay. move and um, potentially to be very, very significant. So I th and I think the disparity in the valuations are rising because people are so fed up with resource stocks um, not performing and commodities been reverting that it's hard to get their mind around actually commodities stepping to a new level. So. Uh, the potential here is gold is coming up to a new level, massive central bank buying, lots of consumer buying in China and other places. So hopefully we're on the way to uh, both the price setting a new level, but also the companies getting their re-rating. All right, let's uh, kind of expand on that conversation and we'll bring up the chart that you have brought along now. Mm. <laughs> For the audience, you're going to see a lot of lines in a minute, but really what this is, is it, it's gold and US dollars, but you've also done a kind of a suite of other major currencies versus the US dollar. So why'd you bring this along? Yeah. Yeah, I think gold was largely despised um, by a lot of investors and ignored. And I think what this chart shows, gold's the top line. It's the only thing that's really performing. A uh, US dollar is obviously the baseline, so flat. And everything else is going down. So if you're living in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, UK, you've probably lost uh, 20 to 40% of your buying power through currency devaluation against USD. And gold's now up about uh, 80%. Um, so it's just demonstrating the power of gold as a store of wealth and um, that it is still working and that you should pay some attention to it. All right. Thank you for bringing that along. Ben, what do you make of this? Signal or noise? Yeah, it could be a bit of both on this one. Um, I have a slight problem with gold in the sense that, you know, it's normally traded relative to, you know, real uh, yields on US Treasuries, like the alternative, you know, risk-free asset, so to speak. Um, and that relationship has broken down significantly in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, so for me, that sort of is a, uh, I guess, a degree of uncertainty that I have in the gold price itself. Uh, this could be like a transitory period or, you know, it could be the beginning of a, of a breakout. But for me, that's a, um, an element of risk. And I do think that the equities pricing, um, I guess, divergence as well could just be the equity market not believing that gold price either. So it, it could actually just be looking, you know, six to 12 months ahead, which is what equities do. Yep. And saying the gold price probably shouldn't be where it is. But again, it's a very difficult um, commodity to value. You've got a bit of both, everybody. You're welcome. I'll let you make the decision on that one. Um, Deanna, what way do you fall on the signal or noise? Well, I'm not a commodities expert, but I'll have to, sure. I think I'll say noise from yep. a macroeconomic point of view. Yep. I sort of agree with the comments that 
it's not really moving in line with what interest rate pricing. I mean, if you look at um, financial market pricing for US interest rates, they've kind of pared back a bit. And some in the hedge fund community are saying that the signal from the gold price is is one that's different to market pricing for interest rates because it's saying that uh, that the Fed will definitely be cutting interest rates sooner than where the, fi the you know, typical financial markets are pricing it to be because Powell will do anything to keep Trump out of office. Mm -hmm. That is apparently the conspiracy theory that's kind of going around. Sure. So it's maybe it's a bit of an alternative uh, there in terms of it's still pricing and all those in interest rate cuts. Um, but again, I just think that it's not really moving in line with the usual fundamentals, but I'm not a gold expert, so it's just a bit sure. too uncertain for me. Sure, yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely understand. Daniel and Ben, I'll come back to the both of you. How do you both think about gold stock allocation in your portfolios? And maybe Daniel, I'll turn that to you first. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're currently pretty much at our maximum, so 20%. Uh, over time, we've probably run uh, closer to 10%. But there's a lot of opportunities out there and partly through this lagging where we're seeing uh, some major stocks have hardly moved on this. We've got some silver in there as well, which is also just wow. starting to take off. And apart from the macro side, we like gold just because the companies have some of the fastest uh, project delivery timetables and highest rate of return and expansion opportunities. So there's, there's good work going down at the com company level as well. Okay. Uh, and in terms in terms of those companies, do you just stay local and... Uh, all and, you know, all you throughout the world, so it's, it's yep. well dispersed and... Um, but yeah, locally, I mean, Northern Star's been an enormous success story for Australia. Uh, it's now, in some respects, probably the fifth biggest gold company in the world, uh, in the Western world at least. And, um, uh, and DeGray is one we've got, which has um, found over 10 million ounces and working that up into a good mine. All right, terrific. Thank you very much. Ben, given what you said earlier, I'm, I'm curious, maybe d is your gold stock allocation maybe closer to zero maybe than where Daniel is? Yes, you're correct. It's definitely uh, towards the zero end. In fact, yeah. we currently don't have any gold holdings. There but um, <laughs> yeah, look, we just think at the current levels, you know, the risk and the uncertainty and the sort of inability to properly explain why the gold price is where it is, to me is, um, you know, we sort of think there's probably better uh, allocations to make at the moment. Nice. Thank you, panel. Our third topic focuses on oil prices. Brent crude, of course, is the, the global benchmark for oil traders, recently surpassed 90 US dollars a barrel for the first time since October last year, and now $100 is very much in sight. Geopolitical risks, quite, que quite clearly, the primary reason for oil's mini surge as this chart remains, as Daniel Hines demonstrates. But one research house that's maybe a little uh, more bullish, uh, even though they've ironically been a little bit stubbornly pessimistic on the equity market as a whole, is Morgan Stanley. They actually upgraded their view on US energy stocks recently, and here's the quote from the research report. Commodity-oriented cyclicals and energy in particular could be due for a catch-up. It remains one of the cheapest and most under-owned areas of the market. So, simple question again, panel. Do you agree with Morgan Stanley's bullish view? Ben, signal or noise? Yeah, look, there is a... Um probably more signal in that than gold, I think. Yeah. Um, I guess for, um, in, I guess from the demand side, it certainly uh, certainly looks much better than what we were thinking maybe 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, the actual global consumption of oil is now, you know, above what it was pre-COVID. So more than 100 million barrels a day of gold, um, sorry, of oil is now being consumed. So that's, you know, fundamentally is a, um, is pretty uh, nice as a backdrop. Um, I guess the other piece though that we look at, you know, as a commodity analyst is the supply side. And to me, uh, the supply of oil um, in itself looks okay um, in the sense that there's not a lot of investment going into that and obviously OPEC being the uh, elephant in the room seems to be holding together in terms of their level of discipline. So that's um, probably a positive as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ben, let me stay with you or bring up uh, this chart you have brought along. So we were just talking about oil. This is a different part of the, the energy complex, natural gas. Tell us why you brought this chart along. Yeah, well, I mean, the only real way to play energy properly in Australia is through, um, you know, Woodside, Santos and maybe Beach as an example. Um, yep. But they're all heavily exposed to gas and uh, most specifically um, the export of LNG as opposed to oil itself. Um, so I guess as an analyst, you know, looking at that, I guess the supply side to me um, has changed quite radically over the last probably 18 months. Um, we had a position in you know, energy stocks coming out of COVID because we saw five years of severe underinvestment in that space. So we saw suppliers being at risk. Um, we saw that manifest through COVID and through uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but you're now seeing you know, early signs of a, um, I guess, a response in terms of the US uh, flagging significant increase in LNG exports uh, and Qatar as well, 
significant increases uh, in LNG exports. If that goes through as planned from both of those, it's you know, roughly two thirds increase in the volume by the end of the uh, decade. So that is a real supply risk and it's making us kind of a little more cautious in that space domestically. Okay, thank you for bringing that along. Deanne, if I think about this from a, with your macro hat on, uh, what, what do you think about you know, where oil's going? What do you say, signal on oil? Yeah, I say signal on this one, uh, just because the level of oil demand seems to be higher than where I think most were expecting it to be. And again, it goes, I think I made the point earlier that the PMI seem to be trending up. The leading indicators looking a bit more positive globally. The chance of recession keeps being pushed out. I mean, the likelihood of one in the next six to 12 months, I think, looks a bit lower than, wh than where it did month a few months ago. So high oil demand probably is going to be good for, for prices. Okay, thank you for that. Daniel, what, where do you fall on the signal on noise? Uh, with respect to the um, geopolitics, I'd say noise, because that's been ongoing and a lot of instances of that actually haven't moved the oil price hardly at all and certainly not for very long. So I think it is the underlying demand's a bit more surprising than people expected. I don't think it's a bull mark for oil just yet. I think we've got enough spare capacity to carry for two or three years. Um, but then I think we will have a big bull market because there's not enough investment going in and um, uh, yeah, that, that'll get absorbed up pretty quickly. All right, so staying with you, how do you think about your, your energy allocation then in portfolios? We tend to run it at a bit underweight. So energy is a third of our sort of allocated space. Uh, we tend to run it a bit underweight. We, we have ex potential exposure to all the super majors and they're quite difficult to find differentiation in amongst. So we come down into some smaller names. So the, the one we've uh, focused on at the moment is Aka BP. It's in Norway offshore. They found some marvellous super low cost, very large fields a number of years back. Um, so they've got a really big developmental program and very low cost oil. So you get uh, some protection if oil does go back to sort of 30 or $40, they'll still be able to make some money. Okay, thank you for that. And the first time a Norwegian company, I think, has been mentioned on the show. So that's very good. Um, ben, given what you said earlier, how do you then think about energy allocation? Yeah, look, we still have an allocation to uh, both Woodside and Santos, um, but obviously much lower levels than what they were held at, you know, maybe 18 months ago. Um, again, we just don't see the upside um, as compelling, you know, as it was back then during, you know, severe underinvestment in that space. Okay, thank you for that. All right, final question of the show team. So we've covered four of the major commodities that investors know and are exposed to, and of course the macro cycle is exposed to. Let's see if we can squeeze at least three more out here. What is one other commodity that you think investors should be eyeing for its macro or fundamental tailwinds? And Daniel, I'll start there with you. Yeah, I'm going to loop back to your introduction and bring uranium in. Yep. Um, so we waited for a uranium bull market for 10 to 15 years and it's arrived and it's definitely not over. So we've got the prices uh, moved up sort of three to four times from 20 to 30 dollars a pound up to sort of 70 to 90 dollars a pound. Um, most of the utilities haven't done their recontracting so we should get good support for that this sort of pricing level out for the next three or four years. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, finally a resurgence in interest in uh, nuclear power for the low carbon electricity generation and the safe base load, you know, all hours. Um, so the, and the stock we've got at the moment that's of relevance to the Australian market is Paladin. And uh, they uh, came back to life and uh, they've timed it perfectly. They bought out their first uh, commercial pr production this month. Okay, thank you for that, Daniel. Ben, what's one commodity you would look at for, you know, its, it's macro fundamental tailwinds? Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Met coal, I think, is definitely yep. interesting at this level. Um, I think Indian demand story is picking up and they're delivering, um, you know, that sort of volume growth. And I think the picture looks quite good there. And you're having, uh, I guess, from the supply side, you're having, you know, the ultra major um, Met coal producers uh, actively divesting their Met coal uh, assets. So the supply side looks quite reasonable as well. All right. Thank you for that. Diana, I know you're not a commodities expert per se, but I'm, I'm curious when you when you talk to, to the AMP teams, is there one commodity they, you are looking for in terms of the, those macro or fundamental tailwinds? Uh, I think we've covered all the major ones that yep. the portfolio teams probably look at, but from a macro point of view, uh, grains are really important just in terms of the overall yeah. outlook, uh, just because it does have quite a big bearing on inflation and grain prices have, have been quite high in the past years, which has been leading to higher food inflation. So that's been something that's been important, but more from a macro point of view rather from an investment point of view. Well, it's still really interesting. Thank you for that. That is it for the Signal or Noise Commodity Show. A big thank you to Daniel Sullivan and Janice Henderson, to Ben Goodwin 
of Merlin, and of course to Diana Messina of AMP. Thank you very much. Our next Signal or Noise episode is in one month, and it's our first ever Economist Roundtable. Diana and I will be joined by Australia's leading economists to dissect the big policy issues that are affecting today's investing environment. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe to our Livewire Markets and Market Index websites, our podcast, and our YouTube channel. And we'll see you in a month for the Economist Roundtable. Thanks for watching and for listening.